In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful gift for all your benefits and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's word. Our first reading for this fourth Sunday in Lent is from the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O oh, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, the second chapter. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said, As Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved in the Lord, let us continue, especially in these dark days, to love one another, that united as one people in Christ Jesus, we might confess together our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Any of you that are a fan of the cult classic, The Princess Bride, probably know the very famous words of Inigo Montoya. Not not the other words, 
The ones where after hearing the word inconceivable being used over and over again are where he says, I do not think that word means what you think it means. And thus it is probably with the most famous words in scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What does the word so mean? Many of us say a lot because that is generally the way we use so now. There is so much gravy on this plate it puts in. There is so much salt on this I can hardly eat it. There is a lot of it, right? But is it possible that that word does not mean what you think it means? You see, way back when, when the authorized version was translated, the King James, as most of you know it in English, so often meant in this way and not a lot or much. And in fact, that is the way it's often used in the rest of the New Testament in our modern English translations. So in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, as Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized, and John the Baptist says, no. I should be being baptized by you. Jesus responds by saying, let it be so now. Let it be in this way now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, at the end of the Beatitudes, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so... In this way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Or in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, where Peter says, For so, in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, some English translations, the New Living Translation, the Lexham English Bible, are willing to break with the King James and simply translate John 3.16, for this is how God loved the world, or for in this way God loved the world. But most of us, because of the belovedness of John 3.16, are unwilling to break with the ancient translation. Because it trips off the tongue, and we're just used to saying it that way, for God so loved the world. Now, why does it matter? Can it possibly matter the way we translate this word and get it right? I would suggest to you that it has always mattered, and of course it matters throughout Scripture, but it explicitly matters right now in this time that we are living through, to really get this verse right. During a time of pandemic, during a time of crisis, during a time when people are asking the difficult questions, we want to be able to point people to the love of God and to get it right. Because you see, if we translate John 3.16 and understand it as simply being that God loves the world a whole lot, in the same way that there is a lot of gravy on the putzin or a lot of salt on the chicken, there's going to be follow-up questions. If God loves the world so much, why are there genetic diseases inflicted upon children even in the womb before they exit their mother? If God loves the world so much, why are there stillbirths? If God loves the world so much, why do bad things happen to seemingly good people? Why did I pray to recover from cancer fervently? And I've always been part of worship, and I've always taken the Lord's Supper, and I've always tried to keep the commandments, and yet I'm dying anyway. Why have churches been praying around the world for the pandemic to pass us by, and yet it really hasn't in some people's view? Back in the 18th century, Europe was not exactly the most religious of places. Christianity was already starting to slip. Yeah, there was a a flourishing of some specific religious movements. Methodism came out of the 18th century. 
But it was also a time of a tremendous rise in atheism and agnosticism. Think of the time of terror in France and the Great Revolution, the end of the 18th century. During this time, though, one of the most notably religious places in Europe was Portugal. And its capital, Lisbon, was a center of Roman Catholic thought and leadership for a Europe that seemed to be sliding ever further away from our Lord. Yet on November 1st, 1755, All Saints Day, at precisely the hour when many Lisboetas were at worship, the city was struck by an earthquake and tsunami that killed somewhere between 10 and 50,000 people, most of whom were killed when the walls of their churches fell on them during Mass. At that time, there were still a great many people that ascribed to the very simple view that when a nation is bad, God will punish it. And if a nation does what is right, then God will allow it to flourish. If that's the case, and if God loves his people so much, why Lisbon? Why Portugal? The same thing happened with Hurricane Katrina, if you want more recent history. You remember when that hurricane swept across New Orleans, there was a rush of people on radio and television who wanted to say, ha ha, look at New Orleans, Sin City, Mardi Gras. We know what happens down there, and God has struck them down with the hurricane. It didn't take long for more sane people to ask the question, if that's what God was doing, why is the French Quarter still standing? And it's the neighborhoods of New Orleans that were particularly Christian and poor that were the ones that were underwater. God loves the world so much. Tell it to the grieving mother or father. The pastor who just lost his church building to a tornado in Kansas or Nebraska. The friends of the murder victim who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's what happens if we don't get John 3.16 right. But if we get it right, we have something to say of incredible eternal consequence to every one of those people we've just been talking about. Every single one of them. And it's why we want to understand what Jesus is saying. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Jesus said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For in this way God loved the world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not talking about some hairy fairy love out there that maybe falls on us in a moment where we see a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sunrise. The love that we feel in our hearts when our cat comes and rubs our legs in the morning before we give them their food. It is precisely the love that God has shown for us in allowing his one and only son to mount a cross for us. Look at the Israelites and their ungratefulness. That's always the sin in the Old Testament, right? You'll notice that it was not because these Israelites out in the wilderness were breaking the fourth commandment or the sixth commandment, or they were coveting everybody else's manna. That wasn't why God sent the fiery serpents. It was precisely because they were ungrateful. Over and over again, God had demonstrated that he is the God who saves. He is the God who liberates and shows an undeserving people grace and mercy. Comes and not sides with Egypt and the pharaohs, but with the slaves. And says, I will set you free and give you a place where you might be my people and I might be your God. And yet time and again, time and again, the people of Israel questioned God's goodness, questioned his mercy, questioned whether he was on their side or not. And finally, 
God sends the serpents. And how are they saved from these serpents? Not by some magic medicine. Not by some poultice that they can rub over top of the wounds and get healed. But God tells Moses to do this crazy thing. Take a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, hold it up in front of everybody, and say, if you look at that snake, you will live. What did it take for the people to do that? That crazy thing. Look on that snake for salvation took faith. God was restoring confidence in himself. Do this crazy thing and you will live so that you won't be tempted to think maybe it was the medicine. Maybe it was the plant that I harvested. Maybe it was the way that I rubbed the salve over top of the bite wounds. No, there is only one possible reason why I am now not dying from this serpent bite, and that is that I did what the Lord said. He provided salvation for me. A salvation that I would never have thought of in a million years. What if we took a snake out of bronze and put it on a pole? Because that's the way God keeps saving us. Finding ways to do it in which we can take no credit. In which we cannot boast. Which we would never have thought of in a million years. What if God chooses to save us by allowing us to kill his son? That makes sense. And that is precisely how God loves the world. That's why we have crucifixes, churches. It's a crazy thing, a crucifix. If you've ever really engaged with a non-Christian, they say the most wonderful things because they speak profound truths that we have taken for granted. I remember well a non-Christian saying to me, you Christians are crazy. You have crosses up all over your churches. Do you know what a cross was? That was the way the Romans killed people. Would you put an electric chair up on the wall in front of your church? Would you put a gallows up there over top of your altar? We said, you get it. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, that is precisely why we have crosses up in our churches. And we don't adorn them with diamonds and gold and wear them around our thing like some kind of fancy jewelry. It is a simple symbol of what God has done to liberate us. And so Paul can write to the Ephesians and say, you were dead, beloved, in your trespasses and sins. You weren't like hurting or wounded. You were worse than that. You were far gone, six feet under. Completely done in. There is absolutely nothing a dead person can do to bring themselves back to life. Do you know that? Nothing. And yet, Paul writes, because of the great love with which God loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What is God's great love? That while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, his son made us alive by grace. There's a fancy word. If you've taken classes with me or Bible study, you know what it means. Undeserved kindness. I am going to be nice to you even though you have been nothing but mean and nasty to me. When you say you've been saved by grace, that's what you mean. I've been mean to God. God gives his one and only son to me. I have broken God's commandments. God shows me mercy. It's that simple. And our life, what do we do now? It is simply to live out what we will see on the last day, which is our resurrection. Our baptized life, where Jesus, before we could do anything, called us by name. Our communing life, where we who are unworthy servants come and kneel at the table and our Lord dresses himself and serves us. 
For we are now God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How is the world going to know God's love when it sees our own crucified lives? When it sees that we are walking towards light when everyone else is running towards the darkness? When we are not afraid to have our evil deeds exposed so that the Lord can take them away. We are the ones who bring good news when everything else is bad. Bruce Coburn, whom hopefully all of you know, good Canadian singer-songwriter, wrote in his song, Birmingham Shadows, I wear my shadows where they're harder to see, but they follow me everywhere. I guess that should tell me I'm traveling toward light. As a Christian, he's talking about what it means to live the Christian life. It doesn't mean we are the light. And sometimes as we get closer to Christ, we only see more shadows. We only feel the snake wounds more. We only see the evil in the world more. But that's because of the brightness of the Christ who is holding us in his hands. The best work that we walk in may be our honesty. I trip over sin here, and I trip over sin there. Why? Because I'm a sinner. Does that surprise you? In a world filled with hypocrisy, we just name it and claim it. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Guilty as charged. I'm not going to pretend. We are not the light, but Christ is the light, and we walk in him. We will not look for the love of God in false places. We will not try and find the love of God in places where God has said not to look. We're going to look for him in the strangest places that the world would never think of and point people to the places where they would never look. Bronze serpent mounted on a pole. A man from Nazareth dying on a cross. We are not the light, so we forgive each other our shadows. We'd rather be honest about our deeds in our hearts than hide. But we will carry out our works in God, which means looking up to the sun, which means looking up to the cross, to the one sign in the midst of our world that God does indeed love you, and me, to the one sign in the world that God does love it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As I said at the beginning, we are at the fourth Sunday of Lent, Joy Sunday. We, uh, we don't have pink vestments, but if we did, it's a good day to wear pink, bring a little color into the world, especially here in the Northern Hemisphere, where we are moving from everything being black and white to black, white, gray, brown, and dirty, so that we have a little bit of light and color in the church. Um, It also means that we are at the end of another phase of the pandemic, as the caseloads in our hospitals are once again going nicely down to manageable levels, um, and we have fewer and fewer cases in circulation. Um, We are going to be able to increase the number of people at worship. As of March 26, we will be back up to 25. Um, So the good news of that is Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, we will have one service, possibly two at Easter. We'll see how many people um, want to come out and receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, But definitely there will be more of us all at one time instead of us having to separate out over three services. It means that uh, my hope and my plan, uh, my prayer has been answered that we are going to go ahead and at least in April, we will have service every Sunday here. Um, I will have one Sunday off, so there won't be the Lord's Supper. But if you're wondering, where do I go for church during April? Here, 11 o'clock. And I'm pretty sure we won't break that 25, but we'll, we'll just do a little bit of checking just to make sure that we don't. Um, So that's the big announcement for today. So next week will be our last online, purely online service, probably until May or maybe even ever. Uh, We'll have to see how things go. But next week, because it is our last online service, it will be an exciting one. We are going to, or I will, 
virtually install our pastor for the Cayman Islands. So we're going to be having our joint online worship again with our brothers and sisters at Safe Harbor Lutheran Church as we install after a almost four-year vacancy, uh, Reverend Dr. Gerald Paul to be their missionary on site. Uh, he's in the middle of quarantine. He'll probably be out of quarantine on the 22nd or 23rd. We thought about, well, we can't really do it on Palm Sunday or Easter. And we just decided, you know, we've been worshiping together through Zoom. Let's do it one last time. And since I can't be in the Caymans anyway, uh, we'll just uh, commend his service to the Lord uh, online. So I hope to see all of you there for that as we support our brothers and sisters in the South. Deb, are there any other announcements we need to make? Uh, mention anything about which? Yes, okay. So, well, actually, two more things that just reminded me of one. Many of you were on the voters meeting last Sunday. We did vote to unanimously extend a call to Emily stoller Prezenko to be our deaconess full-time after her graduation starting in the fall. Um, so we are very excited about that. We had a formal meeting with our mission partners yesterday. Um, we already had our first $2,000 pledge yesterday afternoon after the meeting. Um, with hopefully more to come. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I do know that the Lord will provide. Um, so we're happy to have Emily continuing her immigrant outreach, uh, kids outreach, the internet work, working with the Stones uh, on some of the campus ministry stuff, and generally showing the mercy of Christ to our neighborhood. For Holy Week, yes, we will have in person on the 28th, and Easter, of course, on the following Sunday, April 4th. Fourth, we will have online services every evening during Holy Week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, we will also have a Monday, Thursday service here. At, I haven't decided if it's 4 or 4.30. Um, so that gives me time to get home to have the online service at 7. We will also have a Good Friday service here in person at 11 a.m and then the online service as well in the evening. And we will do an online Easter vigil like we did last year at seven o'clock on Saturday. Our district president, our associate regional director for the region and a few other pastors are gonna join with me as we pre-Easter on Saturday night. So online every evening at seven o'clock, but Monday, Thursday, probably plan for four o'clock on Thursday and then 11 o'clock on Friday morning for Good Friday. Claro, as we say in Espanol. There will be email announcements, so make sure to check your email box, and I'll also put an announcement on the website. All right, then let us join together in prayer as we lift our hearts and our minds to the Lord to ask him to listen to our anxieties, to relieve us of them, uh, and to do for us what we ask of him in our Lord's name. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That God would draw us into his light, exposing where we, like his people of old, have thought, spoken, and acted against him. And that in repentance, we might look to his son lifted up on the cross for our salvation and be saved from his righteous wrath. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the Lord, who by the straight way of faith led the saints to reach his heavenly city, would also lead us to our heavenly home to join in eternal thanksgiving for his steadfast love and wondrous works amongst the children of men. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, that the God who loved the world by giving his only son would bless her and the work of those called to preach the gospel and that his spirit would create and sustain saving faith within us and all who hear his word. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For us and all Christians, that God who made us alive in Christ, though we were dead in our sins, would cause his spirit to be at work within us, that we would not carry out the sinful desires of our bodies and minds, but by his workmanship in Christ Jesus that we would walk in the good works he has prepared for us to do in him. 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the authorities God has set over us for our good, especially Her Majesty the Queen, Justin, our Prime Minister, Francois, our Premier, and Valerie, our Mayor, that God would keep us from speaking against them and so against him, and that God would bless and sustain them with all they need to govern us wisely and in accord with his will. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who suffer in body, mind, or soul, and for those to whom you are granting continual healing, especially we pray for Carrie, and for Olive, and for Catherine, and for Massey, that they would be hid in the shelter of Christ, our light and salvation, and that God would keep them from falling into faithless fear in their days of trouble. Upholding them in his peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all communicants, that our good Lord would feed our hungering and thirsting souls from his enduring love, that they may not faint within us, but be satisfied with the good things of his son's body and blood to abide in his eternal peace now and forever. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just as we receive together our Lord's gifts, let us not forget to uh, offer our gifts for the good of the work that we are doing here at Ascension. Um, sometimes I forget about that because I'm not actually handling offering plates, uh, but we do have our offering plate physically at the back, as well as our Canada Helps virtual offering plate. I invite you to rise now as we join together to celebrate the sacraments that our Lord instituted on the night in which he was betrayed. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal, Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we evermore laud and magnify your glorious name. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Grant us peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Happy are they who are called to this supper. Thank you. 
This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace, and I look forward to seeing many of you at our midweek service on Wednesday online or next Sunday as we online install Pastor Paul in the Cayman Islands.